Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. Today, I'm looking forward to spending a few minutes with you as we talk about Hosea and Joel. Where I'm headed with this is a little bit on what knowledge does to affect us, our actions, and maybe some righteous actions we take because of what we know, what we learn. Also on the great love stories of the entire Old Testament with Hosea and his example of helping those who have sinned feel that they can return to the Lord. And the other place where I'm headed today is God's promise that he will pour out his spirit in the last days. Now, a little bit of background. We're going to start off with these two prophets. Hosea is a prophet to the northern kingdoms. Uh, and we're going to have Joel, who's a prophet to the southern kingdoms. Hosea is lives in around 790 B.C. and Joel around 830 B.C. Now, to set up the story of Hosea, I'm going to read maybe a little bit longer quote than normal, but it's going to set up the, the love story that really is Hosea's life. And so, just starting off, this is from Elder Ronald E. Pullman. John was a thoughtful, kind man, affectionate, with a frank and open manner. He sincerely tried to obey the Lord's commandments and found honest contentment in the joys of family life. Gail, his wife, was young, attractive, high-spirited, but inclined towards more worldly interests and activities. The society in which they lived was, in general, one of affluence and materialism. People seemed preoccupied with temporal gain, social status, entertainment, and self-gratification. Religious leaders were concerned about the apparent breakdown of family life and moral standards. In the early years of their marriage, <clears throat> John and Gail were blessed with children, first a boy and then a girl. But Gail seemed uninterested in her domestic responsibilities. She longed for glamour and excitement in her life and was frequently away from home in parties and entertainments, not always with her husband. In her vanity, Gail encouraged and responded to the attentions of other men until eventually she was unfaithful to her marriage vows. Throughout, John encouraged Gail to appreciate the joys of family life and experience the rewards of observing the laws of God. He was patient and kind, but to no avail, Shortly after the birth of their third child, a son, Gail deserted her husband and children and joined her worldly friends in a life of self-indulgence and immorality. John thus was rejected, humiliated, and broken-hearted. Soon, however, the glamour and excitement that attracted Gail to uh, attracted Gail so much it turned to ashes. Her so-called friends tired of her and abandoned her. Then each successive st step was downward, her life becoming more and more degraded. Eventually, she recognized her mistakes and realized what she had lost, but she could see no way back. Certainly, John could not possibly love her still. She felt completely unworthy of his love and undeserving of her home and family. Then one day, passing through the streets, John recognized Gail. Surely, he would have been justified in turning away, but he didn't. As he observed the effect of her recent life, all too evident, a feeling of compassion came over him. A desire to reach out to her. Learning that Gail had incurred substantial debts, John repaid them and then took her home. Soon, John realized at first with amazement that he still loved Gail. Out of his love for her and her willingness to change and begin anew, there grew in John's heart a feeling of merciful forgiveness, a desire to help Gail overcome her past and to accept her again fully as his wife. Through his personal experience, there arose in John another profound awareness a realization of the nature of God's love for us, his children. Though we disregard his counsel, break his commandments, and reject him, when we recognize our mistakes and desire to repent, he wants us to seek him out, and he will accept us. John had been prepared, through his personal experiences, for a divine mission. Though I have I've taken some literary license in telling the story, it is the account, perhaps allegorical, of Hosea, prophet of the Old Testament, and his wife, Gomer. I think that's just a great introduction to the life of Hosea. Because all those things that happen to this in the story to John and Gail, John is Hosea, and it really is a love story. And Hosea does a lot of things that help teach anybody, even how far they've gone in sin or the ways of the world, there's a way back to God's love. Hosea really is, for me, just a love that will not let go. So in chapter 1, verse 2, Hosea was given a divine injunction by God to take a woman to wife. And according to God's command, 
in verse 2, Hosea married his wife. Her name's Gomer. She was, by profession, a harlot. In this, you see a parallel as, as Hosea starts to teach that Israel is compared to the bride. And Israel has been unfaithful to the bridegroom or Christ, just as a harlot is unfaithful. After marrying Hosea, and this is Hosea chapter 2, summary, and having children by him, Gomer decided to leave him and return to her former life of immorality. Hosea, the prophet, was pained at the sins of his bride and pleaded for her return. Hosea and Gomer had three children whom the Lord commanded to be named Jezreel, meaning God will disperse or scatter. Lora Hama, meaning not having obtained mercy. And Loami, meaning not my people. Gomer did suffer for her infidelity. And you get that painted just vividly in chapter 2, verses 2 through 13. But in chapter 3, a new day dawns. Gomer comes back to Hosea and he accepts her again as his wife. And maybe the entire book of, of Hosea could be introduced with Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5. Isaiah wrote, For my maker, for thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. And so at this point, you may be saying, what is a story about an unfaithful wife and a forgiving husband have to do with Christ? I'm sure you have a lot of parallels already in your mind of how the unfaithful wife and a forgiving husband is like Christ and maybe Israel or the church or us. So here's just a few parallels. By divine injunction from the Father, Christ has entered into a covenant relationship with Israel. Christ, like comparable to Hosea chapter 1 verse 3, has entered into a covenant with Israel that is frequently described in terms of a marriage relationship. Christ is pained at Israel's apostate with actions and pleads that she will repent and return to him. Because of wickedness, idolatry, and apostasy, the covenant people often have been dispersed or scattered, lost God's mercies, or been stripped of their status as God's covenant people. Parallel in Hosea chapter 4, destruction or bondage and suffering are the promises given to those who forsake the Lord for other gods. Back to chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, Israel repeatedly apostatizes and then comes back. And Christ is ever waiting to accept her as his bride, just like Hosea was willing to accept. The metaphor of the unfaithful bride as a symbol of covenant people in a state of apostasy is a common image in Scripture. And I love one of the summary verses that Hosea mentions. My people, this is chapter 4, verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. A lot of times when people do things, they lack knowledge. They don't understand something. And maybe part of it is they don't understand God's love for them, their place in the plan. Maybe they get distracted. Now I'm going to finish out the rest of verse 6. So, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt no, be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of God, I will also forget thy children. So I, th I think in the life around us, if we knew somebody who's spiritually maybe like this, they've rejected that spiritual knowledge, they've rejected Christ, they've stepped away, or, or whatever, what knowledge do you think would be best to teach those people? And I make an aside note. I have found the more that we teach and focus and center on Jesus Christ, the better off we are, the more like we are Jesus Christ. By our example, the better the knowledge that we share is. Because sometimes people see our actions and they can't hear our words. And if you share the knowledge, maybe it's part of your actions, and, and maybe it's just some things that you share, maybe you're thinking, what effect would sharing that knowledge with them have on them? Or in other words, what righteous action would you hope that someone would take as a result of their increased knowledge of the Savior Jesus Christ? Hosea chapter 6 kind of gives just this key and this theme that I love. Verse 1. 
Come, he says, let us return to the Lord, because he will, verse 1, heal us. He will, end of verse 1, bind us up. And then after two days, you've got a period of time, he will revive us. So he first wants to heal us. Then he's binding up the wounds that we have, and we know we've got them. And then he gives us the ability, he revives us, makes us refreshed. I love it. And the third day, raise us up, and we live in his sight. And then I love this next phrase, then shall we know. Sometimes we, get, we want the order, I want to know, then I'll return. And for Hosea, the process is maybe a little different. The invitation is to return and come unto Christ. And when we come, he blesses us three times over. I love that kind of imagery of perfection, completeness. He's going to bless us, and then we shall know. We may have belief or may have faith, but then we know that if we follow on, if we continue on, we stay returned to God, follow on the straight and narrow, if we follow on to know the Lord. I love that imagery. Return, you're blessed, then you're going to know as you continue on the covenant path. President Henry B. Eyring taught it this way. I had a new feeling about what it means to make a covenant with the Lord. In my life, I've never, I've heard explanations of covenants as being like a contract or an agreement where one person agrees to do something, the other agrees to do something else in return. For more reasons than I can explain, during those days teaching Hosea, I felt something new, something more powerful. This was not a story about a business deal between partners. This was a love story. This was a story of a marriage covenant bound by love, by steadfast love. What I felt then, and it has increased over the years, was what that the Lord, with whom I am blessed to have made covenants, loves me and you with a steadfastness about which I continually marvel and with which I want with all my heart to emulate. And then he's kind of the summary for me. The principles that are being taught about returning to the Lord and his love for us. And you may be thinking, how can the principles taught in Hosea help those who might feel that they've sinned? And they've sinned so much that they can't return. They feel like they've sinned so much that, oh, God won't want me back. I'm not worth it to him. What's Hosea teaching that would help us know that God does want us back, regardless of what our sin is? He is there inviting us to return to come back. In chapter 11, I'm, I'm skipping to verse 1. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And they, <clears throat> and you get a lot of they's and them's in this verse, so I'm just take, forgive me for just a minute as I just insert some names here. And they, context, the prophets, called them Israel. So they, Israel, went from them, the prophets. They, <clears throat> Israel, sacrificed under Balaam and burned incense to graven images. And I taught Ephraim also to go taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I had healed them. I drew them, now once again, Israel, with the cords of man, with the bands of love, and I was to them, Israel, as they take off the yoke off their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. And I came, my summary. Once again, theme of, of Hosea. I loved you. I've always loved you. And you went away from me. Like the harlot's gone away, Israel, you've gone away after a false god. And you never even realized, verse 3, I have been healing you all along. And I've taken you, and I've tried to influence you with those, and I love it, the bands of love. And take the yoke off their jaws. There's slavery imagery here. There's oppression imagery here. And God is saying, I'm going to take that all away. The bands, the yoke. I'm still willing to, if you'll just come unto me. And then skipping to verse 7 in chapter 11. And my people are bent to backsliding. 
you're there and you keep sliding back spiritually. You keep sliding back emotionally away from God. The distance between your heart and God's heart, you are drawing yourself away. He's still there. And although they called them, you know, in verse 7, to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? That's a good question. Hey, how am I going to do it? You tell me. You tell me circumstance in which I give up on you, where I'm going to say, I'm done. How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as... Now, there's two little uh, cities here. These two cities were on the same plane as Sodom and Gomorrah and seem to have been destroyed at the same time. So he could put them in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, but Sodom and Gomorrah had some pretty wicked sins, so he's not going there, but he's saying, hey, these were also wicked places, maybe not with the same reputation as Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed, but I'm still here ready, ready, ready and waiting to help you. How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zebium? Mine heart is turned within me. I am just beside myself. I want you back. That's the story of Hosea. And I think if there's anything that I would make sure and emphasize as I was teaching it is God loves you. Whatever sin you may feel that you've done that's really, really bad, God is going to help you and want you back. So our next problem we talk about is Joel. And Joel, in a lot of ways, is known for some of its uh, imagery, its prophecies, its visions that Joel has. In Joel chapter 1, it starts off with something that, that flows through all of Joel, and it's the locus. A locus has four stages of life. These four stages of locus growth are, first, you start off with what they call the gnawing locus. It's just emerged from its egg in spring. Doesn't have wings. It just wants to eat, so it just gnaws at things. But it can't really hop around very well. It's not going to be flying around. It's gnawing. Second stage, at the end of spring, it's still in their first skin, but now they're starting to swarm because they're starting to gather a little or grow a little bit more, and soon they're going to take off their exoskeleton, their first skin, I should say, and they're going to become even bigger. So now you're swarming. You're get, eating that food so you can put off your first, their first skin. Stage three in the life of the locust, they call it the licking locust. After casting off their old skin, they get little small wings, enable them to leap a little bit better, <clears throat> but they can't fly yet. They're unable to go away with their wings until they're matured. They devour everything about them, grass, shrubs, bark of trees. And the fourth stage of a locust, it's the consuming locust. These are the most destructive and often three inches long. They've got the two antenna, each an inch long. The two of its six legs are larger than the rest, adapting it for leaping, and they're flying around. And in chapter one, you get that imagery of all four stages of the locust growth. But it doesn't start off with the translation of, of locust, locust, locust. It uses different words, and it's going in reverse order. Joel chapter one starts with the imagery of the locust going back in time. He's trying to paint an image, an image that there is going to come a restoration. There's been destruction. That's the locust symbolism. There's been lots of destruction in Israel, but now the stages of the locust are going backwards. Joel chapter 1 sets up the idea of a restoration from the destruction that's happened. So, just here's Jameson Fawcett and Brown, their commentary on chapter 1. These are the four stages of locust growth. It could be translated as follows. That which the cutting locusts have left, the swarming locusts have eaten. Oh, and sorry about that. This is uh, Joel 1 verse 4. Let me start again. That which the cutting locust hath left, the swarming locust hath eaten. And that which the swarming locust has left, the young locust have eaten. And that which the young locust has left, the stripping locust have eaten. In Joel chapter 2, verse 25, the stages of locust growth are enumerated in the reverse order, where the restoration of the devastations caused them is promised. The revelations of Joel begin by observing the destruction that has taken place and includes a promise of a restoration of the devastations that have taken place. They, quote, are clearly addressed to a people facing the day of the Lord. That's Brother Rasmussen. It doesn't, uh, isn't a surprise to us that one of these prophecies of 
a people facing the day of the Lord, and a people looking forward to a restoration is quoted by the angel Moroni to Joseph Smith. One of these prophecies in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, was quoted by Moroni. As Latter-day Revelation indicates that one of his prophecies, quote, was not yet fulfilled, but was soon to be, that being true, the series of destruction forces to be unleashed according to Joel's first chapter, as well as the wars of the second chapter, and the final judgment in the third, must all pertain to the last days. Here's the way, kind of a summary, Joseph Fielding Smith described Joel chapter 1, and really focusing on Joel chapter 2. He said, In Joel chapter 2, we have a great and terrible army, marching with unbroken ranks, and crushing everything before it, finding the garden like Eden before them, leaving the wilderness behind, causing mourning, causing suffering. And so the prophet issues a warning voice, and that voice is to us, that we might turn to the Lord and rend our hearts. And then the Lord says he will take that great army in hand, that he also has an army. His army is terrible, just as terrible as the other army, and he will take things in hand. When I say the other army, the Lord's army, do not get an idea he is thinking about England or the United States. He is not. He is not thinking about any earthly army. The Lord's army is not an earthly army, but he has a terrible army. And when that army marches, it will put an end to the other armies, no matter how terrible that may be. And so he says in these closing words, I have read to you that he would do this thing. He would drive a terrible northern army into the wilderness, barren and desolate, with his face towards the East Sea and his hinder parts towards the utmost sea. He would do that, and then he would bless his people having references, of course, to Israel. So in Joel chapter 2, verse 11, you have the Lord, and, and Joel's asking this question, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. He is strong that execute his words, for the day of the Lord is great and terrible. Who shall abide it? I think it's always good to answer questions when it's asked in the scriptures. Okay, day of the Lord's coming, second coming is coming. Who shall abide it? Who's going to be there? Answer, the righteous. So you have verse 12. Therefore, as a result, because we know the righteous will be there, as a result, also now, saith Lord, and I love the theme, turn ye even to me. You skip to verse 13, and turn unto the Lord your God. And you, you go down to verse 14, return and repent. All right, when Christ come, the righteous will be there. So Joel's message, we sometimes would say repent, but his words, I love it better, turn. Turn towards God. Maybe for some, it's a U-turn. Maybe for some of us, it's a turn to, back to the left, to the right, back to that covenant path. But his emphasis is turn. And you want to know how to do it? It's verse 12. Do it with all your heart. Turn, be all in. Fasting, that will help prepare you to turn to the Lord. If you need to, you do the weeping. Get rid of those sins and with mourning. And then verse 13. Maybe we'd say for us a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Or for Joel chapter 2 verse 13, rend your heart. Not your garments. And turn to the Lord. He is, verse very kind, end of verse 13. He will be there. And then on the great promises that, and this is the one of the things that Moroni mentions Joseph Smith, and afterwards says, this is about to be fulfilled. Joseph, this is your day. This is what's coming. Joel prophesies this, and afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And I love that emphasis on everyone. Not just the saints. We're talking the spirit of Christ is going to be poured out in the last days. And I realize this is a little bit different translation of the King James Version, just a little clearer. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. I think for me, in the context, here's where I'm reading it. Last days, God's going to pour out the Spirit of Christ to everyone. But to your sons and daughters, you faithful saints, you're going to have a little bit more. They're going to have a gift to prophesy, to dream, to see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit 
in those days. So I see the Spirit being poured out in the last days on everyone, but there's a little bit of something special on the saints. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained it this way. This promise as pertaining to the last days was made by Joel and renewed by Moroni when he appeared to the prophet Joseph Smith on September 21st, 1823. It has a reference not to the Holy Ghost, but to the pouring out of the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit, or light, which enlighteneth every man born into the world. Those who hearken to his Spirit and are led by its strivings come, come to the knowledge of the truth, accept the gospel, and receive through the gift of the Holy Ghost. President Joseph Filling Smith added this. He, as he, in the context, he's discovering the great. He's discussing the great discoveries and inventions that's happened in our time. He said this quote, "I do not believe for one moment that these discoveries have come by chance, or that they've come because of superior intelligence possessed by men today over those who lived in ages that are past. They have come and are coming because the time is right, because the Lord has willed it, and because He has poured out His Spirit on all flesh." A few years ago. President uh, Gordon B. Hinckley said this very similar things in these words. The era in which we live is the fullness of time spoken of in the scriptures, when God has brought together all of the elements of previous dispensations. From the day that he and his beloved son manifest themselves to the boy Joseph, there has been a tremendous cascade of enlightenment poured out upon the world. The hearts of men have turned to their fathers in fulfillment of the words of Malachi. The vision of Joel has been fulfilled wherein he declared, and then President Hinckley quoted Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. And then he continued on. There has been more scientific discovery during these years than during all the previous history of mankind. Transportation, communication, medicine, public hygiene, the unlocking of the atom, the miracle of the computer, with all of its ramifications, have blossomed forth, particularly in our own era. During my own lifetime, I've witnessed miracle after wonderful, wondrous miracle come to pass, we take it for granted. As recorded in Joseph Smith History, chapter 1, verse 41, Moroni quotes the second chapter of Joel, from the 28th verse to the last. He also said that this was not yet fulfilled, but soon was to be. And he further stated that the fullness of the gospel, the fullness of the Gentiles was soon to come in. He quoted many other passages of scriptures and offered many explanations, which cannot be mentioned here. I love that you have Joseph Smith getting this prophecy and Gordon B. Hinckley saying, hey, this part of Joel now stands fulfilled. And <clears throat> when you get that spirit coming along, really, I think for me, one of the greatest application verses in Alton Joel is verse 14 of chapter 3. Multitudes, multitudes, or maybe a lot of multitudes. That's the emphasis in, in Hebrew just a tremendous amount of multitudes, in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near, in the valley of decision. The other verses talk about the, the, the day of the Lord, but let me just focus on that valley of decision. And just a couple thought questions. Why does Joel use the image of a valley <clears throat> for decisions? It's not the mountain of our decisions. Because sometimes the mountains, you can say, oh, our decisions are really, really big. I don't know that all of them really are. If you use mountain as an imagery, you get up on top of a mountain, you have perspective. You can look out and see, here's a trail. Here's some things coming up that are a challenge. Here's the way I can kind of plot my course. But when you're down the valley, you don't see those obstacles that may be just behind the, the thicket of bushes. We're in a day of valley of decisions where we don't always see the path ahead. We don't always see the obstacles that are coming up. But we have to make a decision. I love that imagery. You're in the valley of decisions. And just none of the thought questions. Think about the most important decisions that we're going to make today. What's the most important decisions we'll make while we're in the valley? Not in the mountains, but in the valley when we don't see everything so clearly. And just another thought question. What helps has God given us to guide us and direct us in the valley of our lives? In those days when we just, you know, maybe there's a little bit of smoke from fire that we just can't see things. What's God doing to help us, to give us guidance to the left or to the right or which direction to go? Well, hey, just some thoughts as you teach Hosea and Joel. The effect of gospel knowledge is profound in our lives. 
it's profound in other people's lives, no matter what their spiritual state. Maybe the question for me in my life is, what gospel knowledge will I share today? Hosea's example is really, it helps us to know that if we've sinned, we can return to the Lord. I think that's one of the things that I would, I would emphasize, that God loves us and today is still wanting us there. And how can we better have Joel's promise of, today, of God's Spirit being poured out into our lives? Because I think that's, I know there's part of it where, where President Hinckley said this part's being fulfilled, all this knowledge has been happening, but what about those dreams, those visions, that spirit of revelation that President uh, Russell M. Nelson has been emphasizing that we should have that in our lives? Because that get, that's light of Christ will, light, will lead and guide people back to our Heavenly Father, back to making a covenant relationship and receiving the Holy Ghost. All right. Hey, thanks for spending some time with me. I hope you have a lovely day today. Keep smiling. 